Well, let me just point people with your paddle. Just point people first. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second lecture. Sorry for the delay. Um, well, last lecture was really uh, mathy. Uh, we believe that uh, the concepts introduced in the last lecture are really fundamental to machine learning. And we'll get more exposure to those mathematical concepts throughout the rest of the course as we cover more and more advanced methods. But today we're going to start with the basics, covering the basics of uh, machine learning, data science, what pipelines people use. Um, and so before we start the lecture today, um, could everyone uh, please go to uh, the GitHub site and this folder, lecture two, and then uh, download or pull um, all the files here. Um, You'll be needing them. And also, while you're doing that, um, uh, today we're going to analyze data from this Kaggle data set. It's basically a climate change data set. Um, um, it uh, records the surface temperature data um, throughout the entire Earth um, for many countries and for many cities since 1750. And uh, basically, you get all these files. Uh, you can click download all and download it as a zip. So two things to do for setup. Um, here's the URL. So, um, how's everyone doing with the setup um, tasks? So, everyone, raise your hands if you're done with these two tasks. Okay. Okay, we'll wait for some time. Of course, make sure to put all these CSV files in the same directory as your uh, iPad on it. Yeah. You mean the you mean the link to the Kaggle? Uh, where? Piazza. Oh, Piazza. Okay. Oh. Yes. Wait. Oh. Okay. Oh. Let me just really do it really quickly. I can do it. Really do it. Oh, there we go. Um, <laughs> what the? <laughs> okay, okay. Oh yeah. Whoops. Lecture, I guess. Okay. Yay. Okay, it's linked. It's posted. Okay. All right. Where's your command prompt? Thank you. 
This is quite a different theme. <laughs> okay. What? Okay, so is everyone done with those two tasks? Yep. Okay, I'm going to take that as a yes and begin to lecture. Okay, so here we go. File, view. Okay. Okay. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, today we're going to talk about the machine learning and data science pipeline. So, we're going to talk about the several different classes or types of machine learning problems, how our ML models trained, validated, and tested, and the seven main steps in the data mining and machine learning pipe pipeline. We'll have two demos specifically. All right. So, uh, what are some examples of different machine learning problems? So we have supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. In supervised learning, we're usually given labeled data, and um, our model is trying to find a relationship between the input data and the output data. And we usually want to predict a categorical outcome, in which case we do classification, or a quantitative outcome, in which case we do regression. In unsupervised learning, we have no labels to our data points. And the model is just trying to find some type of inner hidden structure within our data, um, a hidden structure that might be useful for us to understand more about the data. And so one example of this is clustering. Uh, finally, a third uh, type of you know, problem that is commonly encountered in ML is reinforcement learning. So unlike supervised and unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning um, is about how you can control an autonomous agent uh, to behave optimally with a particular goal um, in a complex and varied environment. And um, it has reinforcement learning as a reward system. And basically, we learn a series of actions that we do in a variety of states that that autonomous agent could be in in a particular environment. All right, so here's an example of supervised learning in the case of classification. So who here has heard of the ImageNet challenge? All right, some of you. Um, so in the ImageNet challenge, uh, they had 10 million plus images, and each of these images belonged to uh, 1,000 different classes. So there might be a class corresponding to a dog and a class corresponding to a horse. And as you see over here, um, all these images were used in ImageNet. And um, surprisingly, uh, deep learning, which you'll learn more about at the end of the class, especially convolutional neural networks, um, uh, were shown to do really well on ImageNet for classification in 2012. All right, so now let's talk about uh, regression. Uh, so usually in regression, you, you would want to be able to predict a quantitative outcome. Like, for instance, you'd want to predict the price of a house, you know, given information such as, you know, how big is the house? How many bedrooms does the house have, um, et cetera. So here, uh, we can take an example from biology, genome-wide association studies, where basically we're given all these genetic markers. And you can think of these as predictors. And uh, we're trying to predict um, some features of a brain scan that a person might have from their genetic markers. So this can be cast and modeled as a regression problem where the input is of the genetic markers and the output, the quantitative output that we're trying to predict um, is a particular feature that you would get from a brain scan, um, such as how big is, let's say, this particular region of the brain. And given those particular genetic markers that the regression analysis found to be important in terms of determining you know, a, a feature of your brain scan, you can then take those genetic markers and predict disease risk for a variety of conditions, whether um, you have a risk of developing malcognitive impairment or Alzheimer's in the future. So this is one another example of regression analysis. Now, for unsupervised learning, um, that's our second major type of machine learning. Uh, here we have an example of clustering. So this is, represents the output of the k-means algorithm for clustering. So we, if we have our, our original unclustered data over here, then if um, then we, then k-means clustering can identify uh, these three different clusters that are present in our data. All right. Now, the third type of machine learning problems is reinforcement learning. 
So here's a standard reinforcement learning setup. Um, it's rather a newer area of research uh, compared to supervised and, and, and uh, unsupervised learning. Basically what ends up happening is that we have some autonomous agent that is in some environment, which you can probably treat as an ant or in, in a practical setting like a robot in a, you know, in, an, in, 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 in a home or an industrial setting. And um, the robot is in a particular environment and more precisely it's in a particular state. And depending on the particular state ST that it, that it is in, it needs to choose the best action AT in that particular state so as to optimize something called the reward. Um, and it does this repeatedly and repeatedly, uh, transitioning to new and new states and taking new actions in each of those states. All right, so that was a summary of the, of the uh, three main types of machine learning or uh, machine learning problems. Uh, so now let's talk about how we, uh, you know, do the machine learning and data science pipeline. How do we initially develop our models, train them, uh, validate them, and testing, and test them? All right. So this video is useful, and you guys can probably see it after the lecture. But our typical ML pipeline goes like this: we acquire the data, we prepare and visualize the data, we choose a suitable model, we train a model on the training set, we evaluate the model performance. We tune the model hyperparameters, and we finally predict using our particular model. So step one, acquire the data. So luckily, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory uh, collected data on climate change, and especially how warm um, uh, various parts of the Earth uh, were. Specifically, uh, the data that they collected had uh, average land temperatures for many countries and many cities around the globe, and we're going to analyze that data from Kaggle today. And as you know, of course, climate change is a big problem, and it's not a hoax. Um, and today we're going to prove that by visualizing our data. All right. Okay, so here are all the tools that we will introduce in this lecture. Pandas, which is a Python library for handling data frames. NumPy, which pretty sure many of you know already, is for numerical Python used in many um, settings like machine learning, optimization, many places where there are lots of vectors and matrices involved. Um, and another useful um, library that people use um, is SkyKit Learn. And um, we won't use that uh, today, uh, but it's really useful. All right. So, Here's the typical uh, pipeline that we go through. So initially, we start with some target data, or with some data, and we select which parts of the data we want as our target <coughs> data. And we do some initial pre-processing with our data, maybe getting rid of you know, records that have NAs that are empty values. We transform the data by maybe creating new variables, new features, and, and then we do our data mining. So what this whole process shows is that data pre-processing and feature selection is very important and it must be completed before uh, you actually begin uh, your ML analyses. And finally, once after, of course, after you do your data mining, you can get extract knowledge from that by doing a lot of interpretation and evaluation. All right, with that being said, let's start this live demo uh, to understand clean and visualize climate change data from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. I hope everyone has the data set and um, the IPython notebooks. There are actually multiple IPython notebooks. Um, so for the first demo that we're doing, um, this uh, Data Science 101 Visualizing Climate Change Data, that's the solution code. If you don't want to type things up, you can probably look at it. Um, and then the skeleton IPython is what I will be typing from, uh, which like filling out um, all the code as we go. Um, and make sure that you have, of course, uh, your files in the same directory, all your data files, global land temperatures by city, by country, and global temperatures overall. So this data set, as I mentioned earlier, has the temperatures from 1750 to 2013 for many cities, countries, and for the whole world. That being said, let's go to, um, like I'm going to the skeleton IPython notebook. Um, I'm just going to wait for everybody to get ready for a little bit. <coughs> 
Oh, are there any questions? So far? Yes? So um, there are actually three files um, that we get, that you need. One file is too large to put on GitHub. Um, so the other two files are in the GitHub repository, but the third file, uh, you can download it directly from Kaggle. Um, so the two files that are already in the GitHub repository, you probably don't need to re-download them, but it's the file called Global Temperatures by City. That's the really large file, and so we could not put it on GitHub. All right, you're welcome. Is everybody ready? Raise your hand if you're ready. All right. All right. So while people are getting ready, let me just introduce the import statements that we're going to use. Uh, Pandas is a really useful library for handling data frames. NumPy for numerical computation. We'll also use matplot, matplotlib, which is used for uh, graphing uh, various things. Uh, we're also going to use the date time library for you know, <coughs> representing dates as objects when in Python. Um, and we're going to do some external imports. So if you already installed Jupyter or Anaconda, then you probably already have all of these packages. But these are some new packages that we're going to use today. Um, specifically Seaborn and Plotly. So the way you can install Seaborn, which by the way is, uh, both Seaborn and Plotly are graphing libraries. The way you can install Seaborn and Plotly is by doing, using the instructions over here. So you can say pip install Plotly, pip3, sorry, you can say pip install Plotly and pip install Seaborn and you can get uh, Plotly and Seaborn. <coughs> Um, also, if you don't have Jupyter, you can I'll probably install Jupyter by saying take three install Jupyter. So these are the external libraries that we'll be needing for the lecture. I'm sorry that the setup is taking a lot of time. Um, wait, what do you mean? What's your question again? Oh. You probably don't have Seaborn or Plotly. Okay. Yes. What, you do? Yeah. Both? Yeah. Okay, we're fine. Okay, I'll do it. I'll just do it again. Let's see who cares. Uh, yeah. All right. Pip3, why? Okay. Pip3 install. Oh, you already have it. Okay, pip uh, install seaborn. Oh, you already have it too. So, okay, so I guess I'm gonna assume that everybody's done because. Okay, so um, now, uh, so we, we do a couple of imports for plotly and for seaborn. I'm gonna run this first block of code. Okay, so now we're going to read our first data frame into um, our environment. Um, and for that, we're going to use a particular command uh, known as uh, pd.readcsv. And so we're specifically going to read in the global temperatures uh, by city file, um, the really, really large file. Alright, so what does this line of code do? It basically reads in the data in this file. 
parse dates equals CT indicates that um, the dates that we're interested in, in terms of in, in our file, um, are in the column that is titled DT. And um, we, we use this, I think, to indicate that um, our columns are not part of the actual data, but rather that they're the column names. Huh? Zoom in? Okay. Command plus. Okay. What? Can we go back to the white To what? Turn to what? Lights off. <laughs> okay. So hopefully everybody has done this. Okay, so we've read in our data. So um, our data has 8,599,212 rows and seven columns. Um, so we have data on 3,167 different days since 1750 in 3,448 cities and 159 countries. Um, and not only do we have data on the average temperature, but also data on the average temperature uncertainty. Um, all right, so now that we read our data in, uh, I'm just going to rename the columns, df.columns equals date. Uh, sorry, I should have done this faster. Uh. And then uh, just gonna type in df to visualize it. Oh, okay. This is not working. It's taking a long time. I don't know, I'm getting some error. Uh, DF is not defined, but I defined DF earlier. I, I did, I, I didn't run it. Yeah. Yes, I had. Whoops. Please work. Okay, can Oh, finally it worked. OK, sorry. All right, so we can see that our data has many NAs in it, um, if, especially if we scroll down. So basically, yeah, we start with our who's Denmark. I don't know how to pronounce that. But we have like so many cities. Um, so we can get the size of our data frame by saying df.shape. And so we can we see that we have 8,599,212 rows and seven columns. We can clean our data set by removing all the rows and the records that have NAs. And we can do that by saying that df equals df.dropNA. OK, and did that to df.shape. So now uh, the number of rows went down. We have now have 8,235,000 uh, rows. Um, and then uh, there's, you can do other commands in Pandas, such as uh, getting all the columns um, in a particular data frame, and you know, by typing in df.columns. If you want to know how many unique elements of a particular uh, variable or sorry column that you have, um, you can use the unique command. And what that does is. Uh, So we have 3,448 unique cities, and we have uh, 
We have 159 unique countries. And um, the reason why we're doing this, although this might uh, be quite boring, is because it's usually a very good idea to understand how your data looks like before you actually do data analyses. And, okay. Um, we can also, uh, you know, uh, see how many unique days that we have, which is the, literally the same thing as we did above. Uh, we can even, there's a describe method um, in Pandas, which lets you uh, find the average um, of all the numerical, uh, just give, it just gives you summary statistics of all of the numerical uh, fields that you have in your table. So you can say df.describe. And uh, you can also access individual fields um, using the dot notation in Pandas. So let's say we wanted the average temperature for like each of these different cities in like at different times, then we can just say df dot average temperature, and we get something really really long. Now you can even select multiple columns at the same time, and the way you do that is you would say df selected columns. So here we're creating a new data frame called df selected columns, and that equals df um, date. Uh, we want date. Let's say we want the date, the average temperature. Uh, the city, as well as the country. And the reason why we're doing this is we don't want stuff like the temperature uncertainty or the latitude or the longitude. And so we can just select our columns this way. All right. Um, so what if we're only interested? Okay, so now um, we did all our analyses for all these various cities. But, you know, to start off simple in terms of our visualization, let's just look at the temperature data for just Berkeley, California. So how do we select rows in our data frame that correspond to the city of Berkeley? Well, this is how we would do it. So we can say Berkeley temp, which is a new data frame, just containing the temperature measurements for Berkeley. That equals df, df.city equals, uh, equals Berkeley. All right, and we can print uh, Berkeley temp uh, dot shape, and also just try to display. So what this head command does is it just displays the first couple of rows um, in our table. All right, so uh, we can clearly see that there are 1,977 temperature measurements in Berkeley uh, in our data since 1849 all the way to the present, um, and we have seven different variables. All right, so now that we have our Berkeley-specific data frame, uh, let's now try to understand how we would plot a line plot uh, that uh, will show the average temperature over time in Berkeley. Um, so to do that, we will illustrate the use of the pandas function group by which basically enables us to group all of our data points together according to what year they're in. So you, you have a bunch of data points. Many of these data points are in the same year. What we're going to do is we're going to take all the data points in every single year since 1849, find the average temperature, and then plot the average temperature for each year from um, 1849 to the present. And we're going to use the pandas function group by. All right. So with that being said, let's code this up. So what this uh, first line of code does is it takes uh, our data frame in Berkeley temp and uh, it groups by according to the year. And what dot mean does is it says that for all the quantitative um, fields or columns in your table, uh, find the average for, let's say, all the temperature data points in a particular year. Uh, so right now I'm just going over the code for plotting a line plot. Um, so this sets the figure size. All right. Um, actually, you can even see the output of this because 
Uh, we haven't finished typing it up yet. Um, but essentially, like, the main temperature curve is pretty jagged. So we would want something more smooth um, to see a clearer pattern. And so what we can do there is to use an exponentially weighted moving average. What that basically means is that it's a, it's a moving average, but that it considers later time points uh, more than earlier time points in this type of cumulative moving average. So there's a pandas function uh, for calculating the exponentially weighted moving average of a particular time series. And we can, we can now use that. So we have uh, pd dot stats moments dot ewma Berkeley temp grouped average temperature this is some internal parameter describing how um, how much we need to weigh the, the later observations as compared to the earlier observations of temperature Berkeley temp uh, grouped dot average Temperature dot plot. All we didn't do is So you always need plot.show to actually show your plot, of course, in pandas. And we got the same graph as before. All right, that was cool. Uh, we were able to see the exponentially weighted moving average. Um, so now we just plotted the, uh, the temperature for Berkeley alone. And we can, we can sort of see that there's some trend towards increasing temperature, um, especially in the latter half of the 20th century. Oh, why is it not showing the y? Oh. Yeah, it's really hard to see the x-axis for some reason. All right, so now, um, instead of just showing the temperature for Berkeley alone, let's now try to show the global average land temperature. Um, and specifically, let's also try to see how the global average land temperature uh, across many centuries, of course, is affected by uh, weather events known as El Nino and La Nina. So El Nino is a weather event in which um, I don't know too much about it, but there's a lot of warming in the Pacific Ocean, uh, as opposed to La Nina, in which there's a lot of, of cooling in the Pacific Ocean. So let's now try to, you know, plot this whole thing uh, for global. So we're now going to read in a different data set, uh, pd.readcsv, uh, globaltemperatures.csv. Uh, parse dates equals. So once again, this you know tells uh, Python to use a date time uh, package or library for representing dates in our files. Index call equals false. Okay. Uh, now we're gonna drop NA because we're dealing with a new data set. We just want to get rid of all the NAs. I'm just gonna create a new. So this is how you create a new. Uh, variable or column in your data frame. And what you would do is you would say, OK, so now I want to create a new column called the year for my date column. Um, and so this is how I, I might be able to do that. So I take my existing you know, uh, date column. And then I say this. There we go. And then um, now we're going to group by. Remember, I talked about the pandas function group by uh, for averaging out um, all of the temperature measurements in one particular year. So now let's do that as well. So global temp grouped is equal to global temp dot group by global temp dot dt dot dt dot year uh, dot mean. And then we have plot. All right, so that should do it. We now have, we're, now we want to plot the figure. Actually, I'm, I just even copy and paste this code. Um, so here we have okay. 
because we've, we've already seen it before. It's literally the same thing. Oh, whoops. That was not intended to be the shape of the graph. Uh, looking at a solution code, this is how the graph is supposed to look like. Uh, we can basically see that the green line represents um, the average temperature. Uh, I don't know if you can see this, but this is like 1860, and this is 2000, and 2013 is where it ends. And we can basically see not just the original graph itself, but also the exponentially weighted moving average. So clearly, climate change is happening. Climate change is not a hoax. We resolved that at least. And all right. So um, global weather uh, weather patterns um, won't be affected by El Nino and La Nina a lot because El Nino and La Nina primarily affect the Pacific Ocean, countries in Asia as well as North and South America. So instead, let's focus on countries uh, like Ecuador, um, which is right on the coast. Uh, Pacific Coast in South America. Uh, so this is how uh, we might do it. All right. So uh, I'm not going to type this uh, because it's really long, but it's in the skeleton code. And basically, we we, we read in this another file called the Global Land Temperatures by Country .csv. We parse the dates and rep to, rep to represent them um, using the date time library. Um, we can. We talked about uh, selecting uh, particular rows in our data frames using this particular syntax. And so we basically say, uh, take the country uh, column of our global temp country data frame. And if it equals Ecuador, let's just take that and let's put those particular rows into a new data frame called Ecuador temperature. Um, then what, let's um, engineer a new feature or a new column in our Ecuador temperature table um, for the year. Then I did this to only include years after 1950 because uh, they didn't really uh, measure a lot of temperature measurements in Ecuador before 1950. Um, and then uh, you can uh, group by um, to get the average temperature uh, for the whole entire year. You can plot, uh, set the figure size, and you know, so so yeah, that's that's standard stuff, setting the x and y axis, but. You can even uh, do some visualizations uh, by plotting um, a vertical line, and that's plot the ABX line. Um, and here, uh, I just used um, information about in which years El Nino was really strong as opposed to La Nina. And it turns out in 1983, 1997, 2014, etc., in all these years, El Nino is really strong. And I'm going to plot a red vertical line. Uh, for all these years in our graph. Similarly, La Nina, which uh, is accompanied by a cooling effect, was really strong in 1999, 2008, and 2011. And we're going to plot blue vertical lines for La Nina. And we can show this. Um, and if we actually run it, then we would get a graph that looks like this. And uh, what we can see here is that we have, once again, uh, you know, temperature measurements in each year from 1950 to all the way to uh, 2013, 14, etc. And um, places where that, that are El Nino's are characterized by red, um, red vertical lines, whereas places or times with La Nina are characterized by, uh, by uh, blue vertical lines. Um, and uh, the red vertical lines seem to coincide roughly with the, with the um, big spikes. Um, whereas um, La Nina is associated with really low temperatures. And when we take a look at the y-axis, we notice that there seems to be like a 0.5 slash 1 degree uh, change on average, um, 1 degree Celsius change on average uh, between uh, El Nino seasons and La Nina seasons. All right, so that was rather cool and interesting. Uh, it confirmed our suspicions about what happens in El Nino and La Nina. So let us now try to, you know, do something even bigger. So let's now try to uh, graphically plot uh, the average temperatures for all the countries in our visualization. And uh, we'll look at a couple of plots, uh, a bar plot and uh, a plot involving a whole map of the whole world. And uh, with that being said, um, 
right? So let's go. All right, so here is the type of preparation that we need to do. So let's use our third uh, file, global land temperatures by country.csv. Once again, parsing dates in a particular manner uh, and dropping DNAs. Um, and so uh, let's now uh, take a look at the country column of this, of this data frame. And what np.unique does is it will give us a list of all the unique country names in total. Um, and then uh, we create a new empty list called mean temperatures, which will contain the average temperature uh, for all the con the average temperature for all the data points collected over the past two centuries for that particular country. So we use a simple for loop for country and countries. Uh, mean temperatures dot append, and what do we append? Well, uh, we take uh, we use the group by, or we don't use the group by syntax. So basically. Uh, we so we so country is a particular string here. Country is a string, and so we select um, rows in which uh, the country uh, column is equal to that particular country, and we select those rows from the global temp country. We from now there are a lot of intermediate steps happening. So we took all the rows corresponding to that particular country. Let's now take all the temperatures um, across all the measurements for that particular country, and let's now take the mean of them. And this will be some number which we append to mean temperatures. Any questions? All right, no questions. Okay, let's continue. So let me run this for a second. We now use bar plots. Okay, so now we're going to use a library called Seaborn, which hope you, which hopefully you installed earlier using pip install Seaborn, um, and we will compare the different average temperatures in different countries across the globe using our bar plot. All right. So how do we do this? Uh, well, we zip together uh, the mean temperatures in the countries. Um, so what that what that does in Python is it gives us a list of tuples, I believe, with the first element being the temperature and the second element being the string uh, giving the country's name. And we sort all, uh, all these tuples according to the temperature to put those countries with the highest temperatures uh, first and those countries with the lowest temperatures um, last. Um, and then we, 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 we cast that into a list. And so basically after setting um, the mean temp after getting the value of the mean temperature, whatever it, that's going to be illustrated in that mean temperature bar, and the country's bar, which is the string of the country, of course, uh, we use Seaborn. So remember that we said import Seaborn, or you can say import Seaborn as SNS, and this will call whatever uh, functions and methods are in Seaborn. And you can say SNS.set, you can set the font, uh, you can set the figure size, you can set the color palette you want. Uh, and so this is the main command, sns.barplot. You give uh, whatever you want for the bar. You give whatever you want for the country uh, and, and whatever you want for the color. Um, and then you set uh, the X label to be the average temperature as well as the title to be the average land temperature in, in all these countries. So here we have that um, our, our, our set of color choices is pretty interesting. Uh, of course, countries in Africa will be really, really hot like Djibouti, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, Senegal, etc. Um, and we get more and more colder countries. For instance, the coldest, at some point we have the average temperature is so negative, like Greenland, like negative 20 degrees Celsius. Um, all right, so that was cool. So uh, now um, we, we use the bar plot, so now let's try to visualize the average annual temperature in different countries uh, by using by looking at a whole globe or a global perspective, and, and specifically by using an orthographic uh, projection. So here we use uh, Plotly, which is incredibly useful. Um, I in fact prefer Plotly uh, to you know directly uh, you know doing it in Python. 
Um, but Plotly is a plotting and graphing library um, that we can use to overlay the average temperatures on a map uh, and, and, and assign each particular country to that average temperature. Um, so let's specifically compare um, the world in 1900 to the world in 2013 if you're still not convinced that global warming is happening, which I don't think many of you are. But so uh, now we can choose a particular year to visualize, and that's 1900. So um, we, we read in the files again, of course. We read in the files uh, from the, the country's CSV. Rename the columns, uh, in, uh, create a new column called year. And, and then what this line does is it only selects those temperature measurements that were made in the year 1900. Then what then we, then we can do is uh, we can create a list of unique countries. Um, then we can, we can create an empty list of mean temperatures and use the same for loop syntax for country and countries uh, append to this particular list. Um, of course, you get all the uh, data points that correspond to that country, uh, get the temperature for those data points, compute the mean, take that mean and put it in the list mean temperatures. All right, so here's why Plotly is really easy, because you can just put in all these parameters, and boom, it comes out to you, uh, back to you, which we'll see. So here, uh, we're going to use, uh, we're looking for a type of visualization called a chloroplet uh, visualization. And what that basically does is the color of whatever your map, and your map is a bunch of elements, a bunch of countries. Each of those countries will be colored according to some number, which is the temperature. Of course, hotter countries will be colored red, whereas colder blue. Uh, Etc. And we want our 3D locations. Uh, this is where the latitude and longitude measurements really come in. Um, and we also want to set Z, which is whatever we're plotting, uh, to be the mean temperatures. Uh, of course, we want our uh, we want country names uh, to be part of the visualization. Um, and then uh, we can also set some colors as well uh, as some other features uh, for the plot. Um, and we can also set the title. We can also set some other features, uh, such as the title, um, the color of our oceans, an orthographic projection, um, as well as setting our longitude and latitude axes. Uh, we can create a dictionary out of all of these parameters that we have supplied plotly. And finally, uh, this command is really important. We use the pi, uh, pi.iplot in order to plot um, uh, using all these parameters. Um, and let's take a look at the visualization. Oh, okay, that's cool. So, average land temperature. So, let's say in India it was like 24.36, and like Saudi Arabia is like 25.48. In the United States, it was uh, 9.021583 um, degrees Celsius in 19, 1900. And you can like probably play around and like, you know, twist this <coughs> earth in like weird shapes and pretty cool. All right. Um, and then, all right, so that was how it looked like in 1900. So let's now, I just did the exact same code, but your visualize is now 2013. Um, now you can run this again. All right, so I remind you in the United States, it was like eight degrees in 1900, but now it was, now it's 11.29 degrees in 2013. So that was like, Two degrees of a Celsius increase. Um, some countries are even more extreme. I think some countries in Africa had even higher increases in their average temperature. I think Canada has a huge jump in average temperature. For instance, Canada was uh, the average land temperature over the entirety of Canada was negative 1.64 degrees Celsius, which makes sense because Canada has some regions that are really, really cold. Um, but in 1900, um, it was a lot colder. It was negative 5 degrees Celsius. So negative 5 to like negative 1.8. That's a lot of warming. It's like 3 degrees Celsius warming. So with that being said, we're done with this demo. So hopefully that gave you a better sense of what it means to prepare, to visualize your data, to examine all the features that it has. So let's now go back uh, to our slides. All right. View... All right, so let's now actually take a break, like a five-minute break. We're, we're now going to collect attendance, so 
if you attended uh, this lecture and the, and the one before it, you'll get a code and you can enroll in the class. Be fine. Um, <laughs> How do you use your stupid computer? Uh, yeah, it's, I was talking to Rohan. <laughs> Text edit? Is it tinyurl.com backslash MLD is cool? How's that? Come on, Brenton! I'm gone! No, I gotta put it on the board! It is MLB is cool, bro. Okay, cool, thanks. <laughs> um, <laughs> this way it's still up even when we're using the slides. Okay, so raise your hand if you've filled out the attendance form. Alright, it's anyway on the board, so we're just going to continue. <laughs> okay, so now let's begin. All right, so we talked about um, earlier steps, of course, preparing our data and visualizing it. But now, let's just move on to the, the next couple of steps, choosing a model and training it. We're going to, of course, 
uh, talk about uh, other ML models, more complex ML models throughout this whole semester. Um, and they're going to be in a variety of areas in machine learning. All right, so how do we deal with our data sets in machine learning? Uh, for those of you who have done data analyses uh, um, a lot before, this might seem really simple. Whereas for those of you who are just really getting an exposure to this field, um, this might be helpful. So uh, here we have uh, our whole data set. We usually will divide it into a training set and a test set. Um, and so for our training set, uh, we use this, the, the, the data in this particular set to train and to tune um, our models. Uh, and we use uh, 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 events, or sorry, we use things like cross-validation in order to do so. And uh, for the test set, uh, we don't touch this at all uh, during our training or validation process, but we only touch this at the very end once we have gotten our final model and just want to see how well it generalizes to the test set. Now, why do we do this? Because if we just had one big set and we trained on it and then we later evaluated the performance of that particular uh, model on the same set it was trained on, um, that doesn't really give us any information about the model's performance because you're just, the model is literally just memorizing what's in the training set and, oh yay, it has a high accuracy. But no, we need to have a separate test set. All right, so having trained our model, how do we evaluate the model's performance? Uh, we use something known as k-fold cross-validation. Um, so what that means is that we divide our data. Here in this instance, it's our training set. Forget about the test set. So we divide that training set into k different parts. So uh, in this diagram, k equals 10. And so in the first round, what ends up happening is that we train on the last nine parts and then see how well our model does when, when given new examples uh, from the first part and we get some accuracy. Let's say with 93% accuracy, the model uh, did really well um, on the, this first part. And in the second fold, that's what it's called, uh, we train on everything but the second part of our data set and we test it on that second part and let's say we get 9%. We do this k times, here k equals 10. Uh, at each time step, you know, choosing a different portion of our data set uh, to test upon. And these are all our validation accuracies. We can take the average of all these validation accuracies to get our k-fold cross-validation accuracy. So at any point of time, uh, we can see how well our model is doing using the k-fold cross-validation. Um, and this is really helpful for hyperparameter tuning, as we'll discuss next. So what happens if we train our model initially and um, our cross-validation accuracy is really low? What steps can we use to improve our model? Well, uh, we can tune our model hyperparameters. Now, what's, what's the difference between hyperparameters and regular parameters? Well, regular parameters are parameters that the model itself will learn. Hyperparameters um, are parameters that we as ML practitioners will have to choose. And specifically, we need to keep on trying different model hyperparameters to see what works best and what gives us the highest uh, k-fold cross-validation accuracy. So uh, I'm now going to go to a second demo, this time one involving a diabetes data set. Um, so in this demo, we're going to use age, gender, uh, BMI, uh, BP, and a couple of blood serum measurements to predict a quantitative metric of diabetes progression in one year using a form of regularized regression called the lasso. Uh, we'll talk more about regression in the next lecture. It's just a preview of the next lecture. But basically, the whole point of this demo is to show you how to choose the optimal set of model hyperparameters that you can use in order to make sure that you, you, you have a really high accuracy, you get the best possible accuracy when doing k-fold cross-validation. Once you, you feel confident with your k-fold cross-validation accuracy or result, you can then say, OK, I'm going to take this model and use it on the test set and see how well it does. And then you'd report um, your test set performance, uh, let's say in a research paper, like I achieved a 99% accuracy, for instance. So uh, with lasso regularization, um, for a regression model, there's one hyperparameter called lambda that we choose. It's also called alpha. Um, people call it different things, but it's the same thing. All right, so this is how lasso looks like. Uh, again, don't worry if you don't understand this fully. Uh, we're going to talk about it more in the next lecture on regression. 
And um, I think in the next next lecture, if I'm right, on regularization. Um, so basically, the way it works is we have our standard, uh, uh, we have our standard, our uh, 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 sum, uh, residual sum of squares here, um, or a cost function, which indicates how well our linear regression model is doing on a particular data given our particular weights. And what LASSO does, uh, which stands for least absolute shrinkage and selection operator, it basically um, you know, takes the current set of weights we have, which are the parameters in our model, and it tries to penalize them by making these weights as small as possible. Um, and it does this in order, um, uh, in order to deal with the bias variance trade-off, which we'll talk about later. But basically, we have this one model hyperparameter called lambda. And um, this, this, this hyperparameter called lambda is something that we as like, ML practitioners can tune um, in order to achieve the optimal uh, validation uh, accuracy. All right, so now let's do a live demo. We're going to use 20-fold cross-validation with a lasso regularized regression to select the optimal hyperparameter lambda or alpha, depending on what you call it, for the diabetes prediction problem. So this is a regression problem. We're trying to predict a quantitative metric of diabetes progression in one year. Oh, wait. Okay. All right, so let me try to open that up. Uh, all right, so here we import sklearn, uh, skykit learn, uh, which is a really helpful machine learning library for Python. We, of course, implement numpy, uh, matplotlib for plotting things. We're going to plot things in this demo. Uh, we import lasso cv, which is uh, a library for doing cross-validation with lasso regularized uh, generalized linear models. We're going to import uh, from scikit-learn um, the library called datasets. So basically what we do is, uh, so th this diabetes dataset, it's actually like one of those datasets that are um, that come with a standard installation of, of scikit-learn. You might have heard of other standard datasets like the Iris uh, Satosa flower dataset. So these are really like standard datasets that people will use just to make sure that their code is working when they're using all these libraries. Um, so we can get our X's, which I remind you that X is a design matrix, which contains basically all of our data for this diabetes prediction problem, like um, blood serum measurements, age, BMI, uh, gender, whatever we, we mentioned um, earlier. And Y is that quantitative output of diabetes progression that we're trying to predict. All right, so. The way a lasso regularized generalized linear model is trained is using something known as coordinate descent, uh, which is a type of optimization algorithm for computing lasso solutions really efficiently. But you don't need to worry about that. We're basically going to call uh, lasso CV, CV equals 20 dot fit x comma y. So this basically tries to fit a, a lasso regularized linear regression model um, uh, to find the relationship between x and y, and we use 20 folds in our cross validation. All right, so um, so uh, we're now trying. So that uh, that command basically uh, did the cross validation um, and um, basically uh, associated uh, with every single possible uh, value of the hyperparameter alpha or lambda. They're both the same thing. Uh, with every single possible value of alpha, uh, there's a corresponding um, accuracy for how well. Uh, the model did on average during that 20-fold uh, uh, cross-validation. So I can skip uh, the plotting and just go directly to the graph, which I hope uh, you guys will, will get because it's kind of very important and it's rather interesting. Um, sorry that uh, this can't be illustrated, but the x-axis is on a log scale. The x-axis is the log of alpha. So alpha is a hyperparameter, and we're trying like so many different possible values of log alpha. So on the right hand side we have 2.5, so 10 to the so alpha equals 10 to the power of 2.5, roughly like between 100 and 1,000, whatever that is. Then we have zero, so here in this case alpha um, is, is equal to one. Um, so we have uh, so we're trying all these values of alpha from just straightforward one all the way to you know 100, 1,000. And what we then notice is that we have 20 different colored lines corresponding to each of, our, each of our 20 different folds. So let's take this red line, for instance. Right? Pretend uh, that this red line corresponds uh, to the fold 
uh, where we leave out, um, let's say, um, the first uh, part of our data set and train on the remaining 19 parts of our data set. So if we do that, if we just train on the, on the remaining 19 parts of our data set and test on the first portion of our data set in, in, cross, uh, in this cross-validation setup, then what we will notice is that as uh, uh, we change the hyperparameter alpha, the y-axis plots the mean squared error. And the mean squared error is on the range of 2,400 to like 3,000 something. So you can see that as we change the hyperparameter, this accuracy on that first fold um, will change. In fact, it will decrease a little bit, then increase a little bit. But that doesn't matter. That's just one fold. We average um, all of these mean squared error curves for all the 20 folds. And what we do is we obtain that particular black line, uh, which shows the relationship between the mean squared error as well as the choice of the hyperparameters. And we're all doing this using cross-validation. From this, we can see that the mean squared error is minimized at this particular value of alpha. Now, that is a particular value of alpha, the hyperparameter, that we will use uh, when we're actually going to report our test set accuracy, because that was the value of the hyperparameter that showed the best performance in terms of having the lowest mean squared error. So, does anybody have questions about this? Yes? Uh, so, you're saying here? Wait, where? Oh, lasso dots over here? Wait, where? Hey, sorry. Wait, where is it? Uh, line. Plot title. Oh, okay. Uh, that that just testing how much time it takes for coordinate descent to happen. Um, so it's not meaningful for us, at least. Okay. Oh, whoops. Um, you need to make sure. I guess that you probably don't need it. You can probably get rid of it. Just delete the line. You don't need it, probably. You don't need it. Yeah. All right. So at least we explained that. All right. So of course, uh, once you have your regularization parameter uh, or your optimal set of hyperparameters, uh, you can now you know uh, see how well your model is doing on that test set, and um, that's it. Those are the seven steps to machine learning. Um, that's the end of this lecture. Um, if you're more interested, uh, I think uh, someone will come and talk about um, enrollment. enrollment. Uh, yeah, so, um, so, yeah, make sure you guys fill out the attendance form, because that's all how, that's how we'll know. So if you didn't do that already, make sure you do that before you leave. That's really important. And um, it'll take me some time, but I should be able to get back to you with all, I'll email you guys out all the codes by midnight, probably. Um, remember that, like, the last day to add a class before you get, like, the 5 or $10 fee um, is tomorrow. So you should have, like, 24 hours to do that. So I think that'll be okay. Uh, but yeah, um, class is over. Um, you guys can come up to us if you, have, if you have any questions or things didn't work out or installation issues or anything like that. Um, see you guys next week. Uh, oh, that's me, you're wrong. Oh, yeah, it's you? Okay. Yeah, I posted the answer that I missed last lecture okay. and that uh, I, uh, I don't want to take this class and I did. Whatever, you said that it's okay. You're going to say you have to go. Uh, did you, did you put the flag?
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 What's up? So uh, I plotted that last thing about yeah. both of these spots. Uh, this is the one we talked about. What's the significance of this one? That's uh, the black line is the average. So okay. it's like just the average of all the lines. So what's like different between this spot and? Alright, uh, that's fine. Oh, you can scroll. Uh, <laughs> 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 Or just, uh, could you just make a problem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, what's up? Oh, uh, I was just saying for like the homework that I, um, I tried to like oh, download it as like the PDF via Lotta extension. Uh -huh. where I had to, I ended up having to like a stop bunch of stuff and I, I ended up just like downloading it as a tech file that made it made from PDF and something like that. Okay, chill, yeah. yeah that's fine, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, how are we? I think he was first, let me finish Uh, you don't want to come visit about Okay, so this oh, yeah. just yeah. isn't running. Oh, wait, I got an error because I'm not running everything else. Um, uh, how do we run everything? Can I just run the entire kernel? Uh, or should I just. Well, you can, yeah, you can do um, kernel. Last year there was one. Yeah, because it was. Yeah, these last three. Uh, this one will work eventually. This one just kind of indefinitely. Yeah, okay. Do you mind if we just like put it here and wait for? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Um, just a quick question. So uh, I was doing the home, uh, homework guide last night. Did you say you posted these slides? And, uh, and you get when I finished it, I wanted to convert to PDF matrix, uh -huh. but, but my labels wasn't yeah, working properly. Okay. So I just I, control I, P did like the. Uh, so I did it out and like. Yeah, yeah, it's totally fine. Also, I couldn't. I couldn't run. The last code because like not the last one, not the neural network one, but the one before that. Okay, it was taking like forever to run. Okay, so was, was that the um? Yeah, this pull again. Was that the RSVC? Yeah. Okay, but did you get the oh. RSVC to run? One of them didn't. Run. I don't remember which one. Oh, the same thing okay. happened to me too. Yeah, one of them didn't run. Okay, that's that's yeah. like, okay. Yeah, I can literally. Forever. It just shows the star and it never yeah. like. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, oh, but cool. like, I, is that okay? I submitted that. Or do you okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One of them doesn't run. Like, yeah. That's fine. Okay. And uh, but when when will we get the time and stuff? Like the the code. The code. Yeah. By hopefully by midnight. Okay. Like for sure. When you go to war tomorrow morning, you'll have it. Alright. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thanks for the yeah, for sure. Uh, I have a question. So I'm um, close to the unit cap, okay. but uh, I heard that if instructors add you to the class, they will want to circumvent that. I heard. I don't know how true that is. Oh, but um, that's kind of like an administrative nightmare for us to do. Oh, okay. Yeah, no problem. So I'll, I'll just uh, submit like the form and I'll pay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, though. Thank you. Uh, Has anything gone? Uh, it might take a while because it's only running at once. Yeah. Oh, I guess it's almost there. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I guess it's you know, but... Yeah, PSPC, uh, RSPC, and the, the basic neural net. Are those are those right? Well, can you get the neural net to work? Uh, it's uh, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't tried running it just by itself. I was I've always been trying it sequentially. Does this look right? Does this look like it would work? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's nothing. Yeah, this is it. I turned this in. Uh, I don't know if you need the output in the turn in. Oh wait, they yeah. downloaded some hey, uh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh you're trying to like listen up the kernel. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I see. Or can I just yeah. download it as PDF? Yeah, download wow. it as PDF. Or you can just like just press like, like, control P, I think. Yeah, yeah. what do I want to write at the board, Brenton? Like, for what? For anything? No. Like, oh, you don't need that. You're fine. Yeah, yeah. see. Yeah. You want to write something? Yeah. Something. Yeah. <laughs> or let's do the SVG. You want to write Oh my god. Be like, hell yeah. Alright. You just want to write something. Oh, you want to write something? The kernel crashed. Rip. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Yeah, that's fine. Just uh, if PSVC and RCC don't run, that's fine. Uh, mm -hmm. Just uh, try uh, try to run the neural net. I, that, I think that should work. Uh, okay. But yeah. And if it doesn't, just turn it in. Yeah. Is, okay. Uh, all right. So, thanks. Awesome. Thank you. How much are we deducting for late? Nothing, right? I don't know. We're not deducting anything. Well, I gotta go to CS70 homework. Like, I gotta go to CS70 homework party. You didn't hear that. <laughs> it's fine. That's, 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 what? Anyways. Yeah, just go, go to CS70. Get out of here. Are you able to make it to the GM? 
Can I? Uh, yeah. It's at 8 p.m. Yeah. All right, cool. I'll do one hour of 7 beats today. <laughs> Are you are you a what 70? What is this? Is uh, this the oh, leader? Because oh, you want to be a team. Yeah. Wait, 